Good morning to those of you uh, here on the West Coast and good afternoon to those of you in the eastern half of the country. It's great uh, to be with you for our second webinar in our sort of two-part series focusing on estate planning and taxes. Uh, if you joined us for our first session, oh, you know, last uh, about 30, 40 days ago, we were talking about estate, ta estate taxes we were talking about the sunsetting of the Trump tax laws that's coming at the end of 2025. And so we thought we would continue uh, on this theme uh, broadly un under the umbrella of estate planning. And today we're going to focus on some of the core tenets uh, of estate planning. And before we get into this, I just want to say thank you. You know, thank you to our clients who are joining us uh, for the opportunity that uh, we are so grateful to be partnering with you on this journey uh, helping navigate life's decisions, financial decision, decisions, uh, and ultimately now engaging with you in deep conversations about your legacy. Um, thank you to our partners who help us with our clients, you know, navigate tax con tax conversations, who help us navigate and implement these estate plans uh, that will that we talk about so frequently. And so, Blake has joined me today, and Blake is our wealth and estate strategist. If you've not had a chance yet to meet him, um, or if you were not a part of our first webinar, uh, Blake really for the past two decades has committed uh, his time to serving clients, people like you and me, and helping them navigate their estate plan. And I know sometimes estate uh, can be tied to you know exorbitant amounts of wealth in one's mind, but really estate planning is is much more than that and, and really applies to all of us. It's it's how do we carry on and ensure that we optimize the assets that we've worked so hard uh, to earn over time and make sure that the legacy we want for our family or for friends and for charitable gifts are intact and in place and protected um, when we're no longer here. And it, in its simplest form, it's it's something we all think about, but I think sometimes we struggle to talk about it because we're not sure how to ask the right question or, or where to begin. And and Blake really is someone who has spent his his 20 years uh, in this space as an estate attorney, working with people, navigating these conversations and, and asking questions and listening and hearing the, the hearts and minds of, of people like yourselves. And so we hope that more than anything, this is certainly informative but maybe spurs a second conversation uh, with your advisor and or even Blake as you try to wrestle with your own trusts and wills and, and what's the right structure for you moving forward. Um, a couple of things I want to just quickly touch base on before we we dive into the webinar's content itself. And, and for those of you, uh, those of you um, that are clients of Miracle Mile, this may be review for you. And for others, this may be, um, you know, a little bit of a 30 second learning, if you will, about some of the things that we're focused on here at Miracle Mile as it pertains to our clients and how we think about serving them. I think oftentimes when we think about the wealth management space and having a financial advisor, we're always in tune that, you know, sure, investments are a part of, of that relationship. And in some cases, you know, for financial advisors, investments are are where they see their, you know, most value delivered and for us, it's a, it's a two-part equation. Uh, certainly the portfolio and the investments need to be sound and need to be strong and need to be outcome-oriented. They need to be personalized and bespoke for your goals and for your uh, investment needs. But in order to do that, um, this page that you can see here on the screen are the things that have to come before we can really build a portfolio that meets the needs and the specifics of our clients. And so you see that we take this goals-based investing approach. We're focused on, uh, you know, educating the next generation on investing and saving and, and how to be, uh, you know, a good steward of resources. You know, we talk about balance sheets, the family balance sheet, you know, we talk about, cons or we deliver consolidated performance for these various areas that we're partnering with you to hold ourselves accountable. Um, we care about managing risk, whether this is from an asset perspective or it's from an you know, protecting assets. Uh, we talk about cash flow, you know, planning. I think a lot of times people worry as they approach retirement, how am I going to get quote unquote paid in retirement? I've been, re you know, receiving this paycheck for, for years and years and years. And how do we fund retirement and, and do that in a prudent manner so that we're optimizing for taxes? 
we think about capital gains and, and tax strategies to, you know, help our clients minimize their exposure to taxes. And then the area that I skipped that we've put around the box around is this idea of wealth strategy and liquidity planning. And, and that's what leads us to where we are today as we talk about estate planning. And so our focus today with, with Blake is, is going to be to talk about really the basic components that go into estate planning. And so he's going to walk us through these various areas from wills and trusts to, to complex you know, estate structures that, that may need to be used to help optimize your situation. And ultimately, again, this all comes back to legacy. We all spend our time here you know, on earth working hard and serving others and looking for ways to, to accumulate assets, to uh, you know, earn an income and, and hopefully pass it on to either you know, philanthropic desires to pass it on to children or next generation of some sort. And, and we want to do everything we can to help you meet those, meet those needs and, and leave the legacy you desire. And so as we go through this, uh, we will have plenty of time at the end for questions. Blake's going to, you know, share some thoughts for the next 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have 15 minutes at least to, to take questions. And so at the bottom of your screen, if you're not familiar, there's a little Q&A button. And if you click that, you can type in any questions that come to mind as Blake is going along. And we'll we'll hold those to the end, and then we'll, we'll walk through them one by one and, and take as many of them as time allows. And if we don't get to some of them, we can certainly follow up with you as well. So with that, uh, Blake, as I said, has been a practicing estate attorney. He is a wealth and estate strategist here at Miracle Mile. He partners with our financial advisors to serve our clients. And thank you again to our clients for joining us. Thank you to our partners who are joining us, many CPAs and attorneys that we partner with to implement these plans and uh, go hand in hand with our client relationships. And so thank you all. And Blake, I'll turn it over to you. Ah, thank you so much, Nate, and, and, and thanks everyone for, for joining us today. I'm going to keep my comments brief, you know, right around 20 minutes or so. Well, this isn't really enough time to delve deeply into estate planning. I, I think it's sufficient for, for what we're doing today. You know, estate planning is so highly individualized for each person and family. Um, and on, on top of that, states, there's there's so much variation from one state to the next. And that that's really beyond the scope of what we're going to do here today. Um, but, you know, so it's important to have very detailed uh, discussions, um, you know, and so uh, we're, we're going to be very general. Um, and so we're going to discuss, uh, you know, a, a few things as we go through here today, uh, but not get really in the weeds. If you'd like to get in the weeds and we'd, we'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you and just reach out to your Miracle Mile advisor. You know, we can help provide a health check for your current plan and, and explore some strategies and how to enhance that uh, plan and, and make it better. Now, my last general note before we jump into it is that I understand, we've been doing this long enough to understand that estate planning can be incredibly overwhelming. You know, it's there's a lot to it. You know, not only is it, it's, 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 there's a lot to it, but we're thinking about our own mortality. And that's that's something a lot of us like to avoid doing. You know, and on top of that, the language that's often used by attorneys and the estate planning world is often Greek to most people. That's important to take it one step at a time. You know, I, I, I recently moved. Um, and, you know, when you move, you say, I'm never going to do it again. Well, hopefully I never do it again. But moving is such an incredibly overwhelming task. You know, but what I did is I just I took it step by step. I took a box. I went from box to box, room to room. And soon enough. You know, over time, it took a long time. I, I I finished it up, right? Estate planning is not inherently hard. It just takes time and consideration. But most importantly, a good guide can make it so much easier. And, and, and so that's what we're, we're, we're helping uh, provide some information and, and provide you the resources to, to be that guide through this process. So that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the content. Um, you know, we're going to start the, the discussion on the fundamentals of estate planning and focusing here first on, uh, on powers of attorney. So as we look at powers of attorney, uh, there's financial powers of attorney, right? Financial powers of attorney are a legal document that grants someone the authority to make financial decisions on your behalf. A couple things to know about this. One, they can come in two different forms. There's ones that are effective immediately. 
meaning that as soon as you sign that document, it becomes effective and your agent can act on your behalf. But there's also another kind, and this is a little more common, and it's a springing power of attorney, in that that power of attorney isn't operable until you become incapacitated. Um, now here's, this, this is a, a, a tough one to get over, right? Yes, it's really important for us all to establish uh, financial powers of attorney, but here's the thing, there's roadblocks out there. A lot of financial institutions and other organizations do not like powers of attorney. Why? Well, you know, there's a legal liability in interpreting the terms of the, uh, of the power of attorney document correctly. On top of that, there's liability for accepting them. You know, who's to know that a power of attorney hasn't been superseded since it was originally drafted? You know, I used to work at the, the, the behemoth of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and, and, uh, uh, and, and a U.S. Trust Company. And there's a lot. I, I could go on and on and on about, uh, about horror stories about that. But even though some institutions don't, it's still incredibly important to, uh, to, to establish these. Now, along with the importance, it's, it's also important to update them regularly. You know, the, the general rule is to update these every three to five years or when your circumstances change. You know, some different things. I mean, you think about, did, you know, if you drafted your power of attorney 10 years ago, was Facebook, right, uh, a thing? Did, did you have a digital life? And, and so, so there's all sorts of updates that have, that have happened because of changes in our society and just changes in, uh, in, in the way that we do business. Now, there's also the medical power of attorney. Now, the medical power of attorney, similarly, it just that's what grants someone the authority to make medical decisions on your behalf. Three things to know, again, very similar. One, it can be springy or uh, effective immediately, right? Um, in addition, there might be a few other documents that you can uh, exercise at the same time you create your power of attorney. Now, sometimes these will all be housed inside of the same document, but sometimes an attorney might do separate uh, documents for each. Now, one is a HIPAA release. You know, this is the thing that changes so dramatically uh, and is continuing to evolve is the disclosure of information, uh, of medical information by doctors to anybody other than the patient. And so the HIPAA release is incredibly important uh, to, to make sure is included in, uh, in your power of attorney. Now, another thing that might be, like I said, a separate or inside is your healthcare directives, your living will. These are what you can embody your wishes for your end of life care decisions and some of these medical emergencies. Now, just like financial power of attorney, really important to update these on a very a regular basis. Every, like I said, every three to five years or as your circumstances may change. So those are the basic fundamental building blocks, right? From here, you know, it's important to think about how we own our assets because, you know, true succession in estate planning comes with coordination of your assets. Just because you have a solid will or a solid trust plan in place, it doesn't mean that everything will go to plan if your assets are not structured properly. So I wanna bring up a, a few of these things uh, to, to, uh, to think about as we go through. So things that the first set of, uh, of assets are, are assets that pass by way of contract. So this is life insurance policies, IRAs, 401ks, annuities, and then also payable on debt, transfer on debt. Those are things you can put on bank accounts and brokerage accounts. Well, these things, if they're set up, they are going to go automatically to the named beneficiary upon your passing. Doesn't matter what your will says, doesn't matter what your trust says, these assets, because they're set up by contract, will automatically go to the named beneficiary. So once again, coordination is key with, uh, with estate planning. One of the things by operation of law, okay? So operation of law are the way that assets are titled. Um, so you can title your assets in joint tenancy with rights of survivorship. There's joint tenants by entirety if you're in some states. There's also community property with rights of survivorship. 
these types of structures make it so that if there's two people that own it in joint tenants with rights of survivorship, if one passes away, the survivor automatically owns the asset. Doesn't matter, once again, what your will says, what your trust says, it's owner owning things the proper way to make sure they're coordinated with your estate plan. Now, if you have assets retitled into the name of your trust, uh, then things are gonna go to your trust beneficiaries and it's gonna be as determined by the provisions of your trust. Now, of course, the last is, is, is everything else. Things that are not by contract, that don't go by operation of law and are not a part of any trust agreement. Well, that's gonna be things that are subject to probate, things in personal name um, that are gonna have to go through this court process of probate to transfer to your heirs. Now they say dying with a will, you're dying testate. If you die without a will, you're said to die intestate. And so what happens then is if you pass away, then your the state law of the state that you reside will govern how your assets are to be transferred after your death. Um, I'm not gonna spend much time because I'm sure that it's probably not what you want. Um, of course, typically it goes to, to, uh, to, to family and next of kin, but it gets really complicated with, uh, with, with blended families. Um, so I, we definitely want to avoid this. So the very least, let's talk about establishing a will. Now, will is a document that sets forth your wishes on the disposition of your assets. There's really three types of wills. There's simple wills, which are very simple. It just says, hey, when I die, it goes here. Right. There's also more complex wills, wills that create testamentary trust. So it's a will that then creates a trust through probate at death. Then there's also another type of a will. This is used with a trust. It's called a pour over will. And its whole purpose is to place things in trust for you uh, at your death if you weren't able to retitle things in your revocable trust uh, while you're living. But as we look at these wills, so who's involved? Well, unfortunately, with any of these types of wills, probate is involved. Now, probate is the court-monitored process of settling one's estate. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about this. There's, there's pros and cons to everything. Uh, there's a lot of cons to, uh, to, to probate. Uh, but for the right circumstance, it can make sense. Or if you live in the state of Texas... <laughs> That's about the only state I'd say die with uh, with a will and, uh, and and probate is a breeze. Um, now, the, the person who creates the will, that's called the, the testator. Now, the person that's responsible for carrying out the wishes and going through that probate process is called the executor or in some places called the personal representative. Now, the key things, number one, is validity requirements, right? Generally, these wills must be signed and witnessed by the testator, right, the person making it, and by two or more individuals. You know, this is something that varies from state to state. But I'll tell you, if you execute a will in one state and, and you execute it correctly, and then you move to another state, your will is still valid because it was done correctly in the state that you that you originally created it in, just like a marriage. You know, my wife and I were married in the state of Iowa. We live in Washington state. Washington still honors our marriage. Same thing with, uh, with, with wills and, uh, and trust. Now, wills can be modified. They can be modified as long as you're alive and, and you have the mental capacity to do so. So these are called codicils. When you amend or, or uh, change a will, it's called a codicil to a will. Now, just look at uh, whew, the probate process. Um, this varies. From, from one family to the next, from one person to the next. Um, if, if, if probate is, is, if you have a very complicated estate, it's gonna take a very long time, a lot of steps to the process. Typically, we're looking at about nine months to complete the probate process. And it could take upwards of two years, uh, depending on complexity. And if you have to file a federal estate tax return and. There's, there's a lot to this process. The one benefit is that it is administered by a neutral third party. That's the courts. 
So if there is some unrest in the family or things like that, or just you just don't have someone that you trust, well, hey, probate could serve that function um, because it's the court that's going to administer this as a third party. There might be other options we can we can discuss, um, but uh, but but probate process it can be very lengthy and very arduous. I just want to give a simple flow chart of how a will is typically structured. Okay, so so typically when we establish wills, right, we don't change asset ownership other than just coordinating our assets by title, uh, by operation of contract and, and things like that. But otherwise we leave assets in, in personal name. So typically one spouse passes away, probate is involved, and then everything goes to the surviving spouse. Of course, all lots of variations here. Um, and then when the second spouse passes away, then assets divided equally to heirs and distributed outright. And Beneficiaries, life insurance, all those different things are, are, are going to be uh, going to the named named beneficiary. So, so that's the basics of a, of a simple will of how things might, uh, might operate. Now let's shift gears. Let's look at a trust. Specifically, I want to talk about a revocable living trust. Now, trust is a legal arrangement where the grantor, the person who creates the trust, transfers assets to the trustee. Typically, it's in a revocable trust. The trustee and the grantor are the same person. I would create a trust for myself and I'm going to be my own trustee, right? So there's two types of trust. There's revocable and irrevocable. We're going to spend today talking about revocable trusts. But quick note, a revocable trust becomes irrevocable the moment that you lose your capacity, your mental capacity, or at death. Revocable trusts are revocable or changeable as long as you're around to change it. As soon as you can't change it anymore, it becomes irrevocable. A couple key notes, right? And this is a big one, right? If property and the ownership of assets are coordinated together with trusts, you can avoid probate. Now, one thing I failed to mention about probate is that when you pass away, everything that goes through public probate is public. It becomes a public record because the courts are, uh, are a public forum. And I said Texas a little while ago is, is different. Well, Texas is the only state where things stay private. Um, but everywhere else, everything that you own, the values and, and all of those becomes public record at death. And so trust can not only avoid probate and avoid all the, the hassle and rigmarole, um, but it maintains privacy because the courts are not involved. Nothing becomes uh, public. Now, trusts as well ensure a lot of control and flexibilities. Most important thing is you can structure your trust appropriately so that your assets will go to who you want, when you want, and how you want it. Now, trust can be modified uh, by executing an amendment. Now, if you amend your trust several times, it's best to restate a trust. I have to tell you, you know, once you get to about two amendments, that's enough. Then it's time to restate. I just read a trust a few uh, a few months ago now that had five amendments. It was really difficult reading one to the next and trying to figure out what does the third one change the fourth one and 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 on on and on and on. It becomes really difficult to keep all those things together. Um, and so that's why it's just important. You just, hey, you change it again, you restate the trust. Then you don't, your, your new trust that you create has in, in, uh, embodied all of those amendments that you've made in the past. So restating a trust simplifies everyone's life and you don't have to keep track of all these different updates and changes over the years. Now here's the typical scenario with a revocable trust. Like I said, uh, we're just gonna go really, not even 30,000 foot view today, 50,000 is, is more like it. Um, so with, with a trust, typically you, you have your assets all retitled into the name of the trust while you're alive. A couple caveats to that are gonna be those things that, uh, that, that go by contract, your IRAs, you know, things like that. Um, so at the first, death, uh, typically things go into 
a structure that creates a marital trust and a family trust. And then there's a survivor's trust. So this is a married couple's plan. So the, the, the survivor's trust is going to be funded with the survivor's separate assets and their share of the community assets. And these other trusts, the family trust, the marital trust, are going to be funded with the deceased spouse's assets. Of course, there's all sorts of ways to, to make this your own and, and, and live up to every goal and expectations that, uh, that, that you might have in, in continuing to care for your loved ones and, uh, and, and your families. Uh, but typically, the way these are set up, you know, the survivors trust, the surviving spouse is the beneficiary of that. They're also the beneficiary of the marital trust, and then they're the beneficiary of the family trust as well. And it's not until the second death that assets go out to fund trust for the children or outright to the children or maybe a combination thereof, and also go out to other named beneficiaries, charities, and, and, and things like that. Um, so there's, there's a, a general flow is, uh, is what you see here. Um, the most important thing for a lot of families is that probate avoidance. And I just wanted to just boil it down real quick and, and just go over a few of these differences between wills and trusts. Uh, and this is obviously, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, but, you know, as you think about what can dispose of your assets at death, well, definitely a will and a trust can, uh, can do that. However, the second one down requires court supervision. Well, that's, that's with a will. You have to go through probate through the courts. Uh, trust, they do not. Now, privacy concerns, if, if privacy is, is important to you, a trust is the better fit. As I said, probate is a public court system. Everything that goes through there is a public record. Uh, so with, that's not the case with trusts. Now, retitling property during lifetime. You don't have to do that with a will, but with a trust, you do. Um, and it's important to coordinate. Uh, once again, I'm going to say that about 10 more times, probably. Coordination is, uh, is key. Now, these last three points I want to make uh, is really, really important because I often get the question, and there's always the comment out there that trusts are only for the wealthy. Let, let, let's look at these next things. Incapacity protection, business owners, and if you have children or others with special needs. Here's a scenario. If you have a will, when you die, your assets are frozen as this probate process commences. And your assets could, could be frozen for a significant period of time, right? That probate process has to begin. So death happens, then it's up to your, your attorney and your, your executor to go get an appointment with the court and start the probate process. So for several months on end, your assets could be frozen. So if you're a business owner, could be a bad, bad thing. As business owners, you need to make decisions right away. You need to sign payroll checks. You need to open the doors for the, you know, for, for your employees and things like that. Well, if you have children with special needs and you're supporting children or, or family members or others, well, at your death with a will, your assets are, are, are frozen. So that, that support mechanism is cut off until maybe a few months down the road when, uh, when, when probate is, is in, in, uh, uh, in process. Now, the other is incapacity protection. Incapacity protection is so much more enhanced with a trust over a will. Uh, and it just goes back to your trust establishes a clear line of succession. If I become incapacitated, here's the next person who can take over for me. And then here's the one after that and the one after that. It, it provides much more continuity of control for these different and difficult processes uh, uh, in, in life and, and things that can happen. So, so yes, a will can dispose of your assets at death, but, but I think you should think twice um, and, and explore all that, uh, all that a trust could mean for you. Of course, caveat, if you live in Texas, 
take that all with a grain of salt, a will might actually be just fine for you. But in capacity protection, if you're in Texas, still not the greatest with a, uh, with a will. Okay. That's the fundamentals, right? We talked about powers of attorney. We talked about wills. We talked about trusts. Well, now is the pivot, right? Well, what about estate taxes, estate tax planning? You, if you tuned in last time, you, you, you saw that, uh, you know, that we today have a $13.61 million federal estate tax exemption. Each of us can use that. So husbands and wife can use that times two. But our tax law, as, as Nate said earlier, is expiring at the end of 2025, at which time these numbers are going to be cut back in half. There's a lot of different tools and techniques to look at for estate tax planning. And this is where there's so much nuance in, in things with these techniques that, uh, that I hesitate to even mention uh, any by name, because by doing that just, you know, sets off so many different cans of worms that I have to open and close and open and close. And, uh, and we just don't have the time, nor I, do I think it's that beneficial. As I said, being, you know, having these individualized discussions is, is, is really what's going to create the best results. So, um, but a few things I do want to point out. Now, as I said before, each of us can pass on 13.61 million tax free. Now, there was a tax law passed in 2014, we call that estate tax portability. And what that says is that if one spouse passes away and does not use their full exemption, the surviving spouse may use that remaining exemption at their death. It's portable, okay? However, the generation skipping tax is not portable. So the generation skipping tax, this is another one of these cans of worms, right? Um, the idea is that you're able to skip taxation at one generation, uh, and that's allowed by the IRS. So you can pass on things to your children in such a way that is not going to be estate taxable when your children die. So it's going to skip a whole level of taxation. And so one really important thing is that your estate tax exemption is portable from one spouse to the next. You don't have to do anything. But the generation skipping tax exemption is not. It's a use it or lose it proposition. Um, so really, really important to, uh, uh, to, to understand some of these really, really uh, unique and, and important you know, concepts. Now, of course, there's there's also ways to reduce your taxable estate by making charitable gifts. Um, we do a lot of these and we suggest a lot with donor advised funds and all different uh, charitable vehicles. But I'll say just hands down, if you're thinking about making gifts to charity, IRAs, qualified funds, 401ks are the very best avenues to, uh, to do that. Now, we're going to talk more about this in October. Uh, at our uh, uh, another session that that Nate and I will uh, will be presenting, um, but you know as what I said at the very beginning, if you'd like to talk about some of these things, you know especially these really you know uh, sophisticated estate planning techniques, you know reach out to us um, and we're happy to meet one on one with you to discuss your uh, your strategies, uh, these strategies and how they might help. Um, uh, meet your goals because you know you might have seen this slide before too. There's there's a lot out there in the uh, in the planning landscape, and you know for some families one makes more sense than another. Um, but just so you know, we're here to help you figure out with what you're trying to accomplish, your goals in your unique family situation, which one of these uh, is is applicable and worth exploring. So with that, I'm just gonna end by just saying, hey, planning is a process and it's not an event, right? As much as we think that estate planning is a sprint to the finish, right? Hey, I'm going on a trip. I wanna get this done before I go on this trip or I've got a child on the way. I wanna update my estate plan before they're born. It seems like a sprint, but it's definitely a race that you're gonna be running the, the rest of your lives.
right? So important to think, you know, great care and thought are gonna lead to the absolute best results. So thank you very much. I'm gonna turn uh, turn the, uh, uh, the the reins over to, uh, to Nate. Great, Blake, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful insights, uh, great foundation for all of us and uh, review for some, I'm sure, but uh, spur spurring questions nonetheless. So let's jump in. Um, uh, first question to, to throw at you, Blake, if you have a current will and want to establish a trust or, and said another way, you do establish a trust, what happens to that will? Yeah. Um, and so that, that will gets superseded. Um, it, you know, when you create a will, you say, Hey, this will is my new will and it supersedes anyone that's, that's, uh, that's been created in the past. So, um, so it's important to destroy those documents just so that there's no confusion down the road to say, Hey, here's a will from 2004 and here's a new one from 2020. Well, you know, so, but, but yes, they, they just get overwritten and, and, and superseded. So good question. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'll ask this question and, you know, it, um, hopefully you can stay at a high enough level that, you know, we, we don't, you know, scare people away. But you, in, you were talking about a revocable trust or you were talking about the revocable trust model. Uh, you talked about the functions of the three sub trusts that would be created after death of the first spouse, you know, family trust, marital trust, or survivor trust. Can you just talk a little bit about how those function once that happens? Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, like I said, I, I'll, I'll try to just keep my cans of worms as small as possible, right? Uh, because that's typically how it is. There, there's these three different trusts that are that are set up. Um, now, sometimes we actually keep things whole. We'll, we'll do a joint trust. And at the first spouse's death, everything will stay inside of that trust. It just depends on the different circumstances with, with the family because that three trust structure um, that, that we often see, that's employed a lot because when the, when the first spouse passes away, anything that goes over into that uh, family trust, the bypass trust or the marital trust are things that are separate from the surviving spouse, meaning that they're going to be protected from the surviving spouse's creditors. Um, and, you know, we think about nursing homes and, and things like that, but also just liability uh, protection. So, so I, I will say that family trust is really the bucket that we fill up first with the federal estate tax exemption amount. And then the marital trust bucket, that's all the overflow from that. Um, and, and we typically, we set these trusts up with this, the ascertainable standard, um, which really it, it's four magic words. Um, the trusts say that, hey, the beneficiary, the surviving spouse, whoever it is, right, can access and, and receive benefits and distributions from this trust for their health, education, maintenance, and support needs. Um, very, very gray. And, and it's designed to be gray because our, our, our lives and, and the world is ever evolving. And, and those four magic words have a lot of case law behind them and they can, they can, they're very nimble uh, and, and can be used and, and, and applied in, in different ways as the years go on. So um, I, I, you know, I'm going to turn well it as concise as I can be. <laughs> well, Hey, well said. I think that, that was, that was great. And, and like, like we said at the front end of this, if this is spurring additional questions and whether you're a client of ours or not, uh, and you're interested, uh, send an email to info at miraclemileadvisors.com. And we're happy to just engage in a conversation that's educational in nature. And if, the, if, and, or if there's something there that's actionable that you want to engage with us on, we, we want to be here to help and support whether you're a client or someone who's just trying to find the right, the right answers. Um, next question, uh, the estate tax exemption that I, um, I mentioned in our opening here, and I think Blake, you alluded to it at, at one point, you know, that it's sunsetting at the end of 2025. Uh, the question here talks about how, well, things are always quote unquote sunsetting, but then Congress extends them. I think, you know, my answer to that is, uh, will this be extended? I think Congress often extends things, but rarely do they extend them in their exact form. And so I think the question becomes, 
what are your thoughts? Does this get extended and or do you, if it does get extended, does it look different? Um, politics aside, uh, what are you, any, any thoughts on, on this structure based on kind of where we're at as we think about, you know, budgets and financials and, and sort of the themes that we're hearing? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'd give you a little bit better answer uh, in November. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I, if, if you can, um, you know, uh, whoever asked the question, take a look at the, the last webinar that, uh, that, I, that we did a few months ago, because there, there's a lot of variables at play. You know, the federal deficit is not getting any smaller. Um, and so the, the federal estate tax is, is, is definitely a lever to pull to, uh, uh, to, to get some more you know, tax relief. It's not popular. Uh, I'm from Iowa, and you know that's always been the thing of hey, we're we're gonna have to sell the farm to pay the estate tax, and and so it is it is not a a very popular tax law, but it's been around since 1916, and it was originally designed to fund World War One, um, and then again World War Two. It's actually was 94 uh, percent was the estate tax in 1944. You didn't know that, but. Um, we, we've gone up and down and up and down, and we're going to continue to go up and down and up and down. But I will say, unfortunately, what we have are essentially sticky notes that are placed on the 1986 federal tax code. Okay, And so this sticky note that we have here, it's expired. It's probably going to fall off. But we still have this 1986 tax code, which is monstrous. I mean, if you lined it up, Page over page, it's it's like a marathon worth of uh, of a walk run for you as you uh, read it. Uh, you know, so so I you know politics aside, um, I I don't think historically the federal estate tax has never been a huge money maker for the federal government. Um, so I can foresee them extending, but. I can also see the way that our government works is that everyone wants to point fingers and they, you know, we're playing towards the corners and the, 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 the left is trying to out left and the right is trying to out right. And so there's nothing that happens in the middle. And because of that, it'll be really easy for us to go over this cliff and be faced with what we have. And unfortunately, yes, the, the, the election, we will, we'll know more after the election, but historically speaking, we don't find out what's going to happen with the tax laws until a couple weeks before they expire. So, so yes, we'll have some sign in, in November of this year, but we probably won't have anything definitive until December of 2025. And of course, by then it's too late. And so it's really important to start the process, start these conversations now while you have plenty of time to design something and work with your attorney to put things in place. Um, because, you know, better be safe than sorry. So, yeah, well said. Um, getting some questions about, um, you know, costs of trust or, you know, there's other, op you know, uh, providers, you know, legal zoom online. Right. And there's uh, a few others that have, that have come. There's a few that have come and gone. Um, you know, I think there's, so there's two parts to this question, you know, are these sufficient solutions Second, uh, what are the pros and cons of of maybe a, an online offering versus you know having a conversation with someone like yourself? Uh, maybe and then maybe talk about the nuance of, in terms of working with you for advice and guidance and setting up a structure, but then actually the attorney then you know creating the trust itself. Yeah, and and thank you that that you did not include cost in there because. That is so nuanced based on circumstances and your metropolitan area you live. But well, the cost question was in there. I just yeah. I just know we can't <laughs> fully answer that. So I'm gonna type that one out and I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take Thank that you. one off your plate. <laughs> oh yeah, I get us all the time and I review documents that legal zoom and, and all these trusts and estates that they that they create. And um and, and I'll just say that they can work, right? But where they fail, utterly fail, is in customization. Um, you know, if 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 you don't have any children and you're just leaving things to charity, hey, might be just fine.
But if you have any sort of contingencies that you want to plan for of, hey, I want to give this to my children, but what if my child predeceases me or things like that, right? I would steer clear of, of LegalZoom. The way that we work and, and approach uh, uh, our approach with, with clients is just, you know, we start off with just having a conversation, getting to know you and trying to figure out what it is that you'd like to have happen. Um, we, we do this typically over about three meetings. So the first meeting is really a get to know you, how, you know, what's going on in your life, what's important and, and, and get to know your goals. The second meeting is, is then I'll analyze your current estate plan, current will, trusts, and, and, and give you that a perspective of where you're at today because we can't, we can't plan for tomorrow unless we have a good idea of where we're at today, right? So we do that in the second meeting. And then really the third meeting is, okay, we know what your goals are from the first meeting. We, we know where we're standing and where we're at today. Here's some recommendations for how to make this better. And then through that process, then we will uh, uh, create, you know, an action plan uh, or an outline of updates the current plan, or maybe it's starting fresh and here's the different components to put in there. And we'll have these conversations so that before you even go to your attorney's office, you're going to thought through these things. You're going to be able to have an intelligent conversation with your attorney. And then on, on, on the flip side of that as well is once your attorney engages with you, uh, they'll give you draft documents to review before you sign and, and complete them. It's at that stage, I'm also here to help. If you want to send those to us, we can go over those together. We can you know, make sure that they're up to par legally, which typically all of them are for the most part. But where I find they fail is meeting your goals and expectations. And so that's what we can have that conversation to make sure that they're legally good and that they actually meet your expectations and, and we bring the two together. Yeah. And then, yeah. Perfect. I, no, I think that's, I think that's, that's great. Uh, you know, uh, another question around um, if my estate isn't close to the lifetime estate gifting amount, do I need an irrevocable trust? Great question. Um, there's so many variables there. It depends. Um, so let, let's take that one offline, but typically no, typically okay. If, if you don't have an estate tax issue or things like that, no. However, if you still want to create a vehicle for your children to make sure that they use money appropriately or to make sure that it's protected from your children's divorce or creditors and things like that, you may consider creating an irrevocable trust for them. Or it, it just, there's there's so many variables. So it, it's, it's not a blanket no, it's a maybe. Um, but typically, typically no. Um, but you know, like I said, let's 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 take that one offline and, and happy to talk about uh, your circumstances and, and see if that you know makes sense or not. Yep. So there's like six questions left, and we have just a couple minutes left. So I don't know that we're gonna get to every one of these. So I'm gonna try to lump a couple together uh, yeah. as we as we get ready to wrap. So a question about QPRTs. Sure. So perhaps you could just give a quick definition of what a QPRT is. I guess I'm guessing not everybody knows what that stands for. Yeah. And then, um, you know, the question here is very general. So I think if you could just provide a couple bullet points about, you know, what they are and when they're used. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So QPRT is one of the many acronyms that we use in estate planning. It's called a Qualified Personal Residence Trust, QPRT. And the idea for this is this is a strategy of where you can gift your interest in a piece of property, but retain an interest in it. And it's kind of, it's, it's unique, uh, not for everybody. So the idea, typically these are set up on 10 year terms. And so you create this trust, you place this piece of property in trust. And for the next 10 years, the property is, is yours to use as you please. But after that term of years is over, then the gift is complete. So now the, 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 the property is now fully owned by the trust. You can continue to use that property, but you have to pay rent 
uh, for your use of that property, um, which there's there's good and bad to uh, to that. But most importantly is that these are great tools to leverage your gifting because when you make a gift of that property into the Cooper, you're not giving it at the fair market value. You're giving it at what it's going to be worth in 10 years after your term of years and your use of it is over. And so, for instance, you might have a, a piece of property worth a million dollars uh, that you place in this trust. Well, the IRS life tables might say that that $100 million gift is really only worth $500,000 uh, uh, for gift tax purposes. So, so a lot of nuance there. Happy to happy to work through it. Uh, I will say last point is that Huperts, these qualified personal residence trusts, are more attractive when interest rates are high. Um, and so we're in a pretty decent environment. So Huperts, you, you might hear that uh, come up more and more as interest rates stay high. And we're looking at ways, clever ways to make our gifts go further. Yep. And uh, I'll tie up what you just said to the next one. And I think if you have more questions on the Cuperts or more questions on that, that uh, based on the the Ladybird deed question just came up. Uh, yeah. And uh, look, the long and short of the Ladybird deed, it's very similar in this in terms of this idea of protecting property. Um, and what it does is, it, you know, it allows the beneficiary to take the property without going through probate. It is only allowed in five states, uh, as I, you know, as I understand it currently. Um, a few more. A few more, but still. A few, a few, okay, so a few more have added. I think the other concern is, you know, so limited number of states, um, property taxes may be higher for the beneficiary on the other side. So there's, again, some nuances there. I think that's probably another question that's better in a one-on-one -on -one setting, diving into some of the, the dynamics of where the property is and where the okay. beneficiary is going to live um, in all of those things. So we'd love to talk Absolutely. further if someone would like to do that, um, it came from an anonymous attendee, so I, I can't um, say they who use the word ladybird, so they're probably from Texas. So, <laughs> hello, Texas. Yeah. Uh, so, there's, um, you know, here's where I think we can end uh, just because we're getting, we're getting, actually, I'll give you one more question and then I'll wrap it up. Okay. What benefits does one have to quote unquote house a trust in a state like Delaware? Why is that often bantered around? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, how long how, how long do we have here? Two minutes. Um, you have two, two minutes. minutes. Oh, okay, well, using a different state like Delaware or South Dakota, Nevada, uh, Alaska, there, there, there's a lot of these trust jurisdictions. And the reason why these are used is because if you create a trust utilizing that state law and have some sort of a Situs in the in the state, meaning you've got a trustee or or something like that in the state. You're availing yourselves of the laws of that state. So there's probably enhanced creditor protection in these different states, but most importantly, there's a repeal against the rule against perpetuities. So the idea is this is an old law that came from you know old English times. Said hey, assets can't stay in trust forever, right? So they created this rule against perpetuities. More or less about 90 years, assets can stay in trust. And that was the common law of all the United States until about late 1960s or so. Idaho was, I think, the first state to repeal it. But so there's these states like Delaware, South Dakota, Nevada, that have repealed the rule against perpetuities. So assets, trusts in these states can live on into perpetuity. Um, so there's a lot more to it than that, um, but I'll, I'll end it there and uh, I'll, in, I'll definitely invite, uh, this is, those are things really fun for me to talk about. So you'll get a very exuberant Blake if you ask me uh, about that when we're meeting, so. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I love it. So I think the, the, the way we'll sum this up, now I'm gonna take a couple questions here that are tied to, you know, do I need an investment advisor, CPA and estate planning attorney? You know, that's a lot of people that like gets expensive. Um, how do I know if a plan is good or bad from an estate perspective? Um, so here, here's how I would sort of uh, lump these together when you think about this. You know, in terms of how we, you know, partner with our clients, um, you know, we we are fiduciaries. Uh, it's why we are in the RIA environment that we are in. 
is so that we are truly held accountable to our clients and their well-being. And the decisions that we are making with them and for them and the advice we're providing is putting them at the center of, of, of everything. And so when we talk about Blake, you know, partnering with one of our advisors with a client, there's no additional charge for that. When we talk about offering tax advice, there's no additional charge for that offering. And so what we've tried to do is to truly bring not just, you know, a solid technology capability to our clients, but but more importantly, we still firmly believe in the human side of this, this business. And so we are able to take your personal situation, review your will and your trust, and give you advice that is not based on anything that benefits us when it comes to estate planning. And so this is speaking to the question of, is it good or bad? We're just here interpreting the existing rules and laws as they are today and thinking about what it is you're sharing with us as your goals and objectives and how to help those best come to life based on the vehicles that are available to you. And so then going back to this question of a CPA and a, and, you know, uh, advisor and a uh, attorney from a cost perspective um certainly there's a cost to to any of these things but we're trying to mitigate those costs and give you that expertise and that insight in one place and so when we are done giving you a review of your will or your trust and and or making recommendations about how to implement this you know we're then partnering with you and that attorney to try to be as efficient with that attorney's use of their time and so uh, same thing on the CPA side. We're partnering with a CPA and working in conjunction with them to try to create more efficiencies in the time where there may be a billable hour that's being paid to the attorney to write up the documents or to the CPA for a tax return. So we would love to talk more about how to make sure that you're you're not spending more than you need to spend. Um, we're happy to review your existing plans. That's not a cost to you to do that. Um, to help you understand, is it good or is it, could it be potentially better? So with that, Blake, thank you so much for your insights, your expertise and your partnership. And thank you again to all of you who are out there as our, our clients, our partners, uh, or you're just tuning in to learn more about the estate planning world. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you on July 25th at 10 a.m. where we shift gears and actually talk about investments and, and what's going on in the markets uh, for a mid-year investment review. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again, Blake. Have a great 4th of July holiday week. Bye, everyone.